about you, tell things you wanna ask me. Anything will do. We won't have phones to the world. All around the world, there's you. Hi everyone and welcome back to the virtual Benedetti sessions and episode six of Ask Our Tutors. I'm Ruth Nelson and I'm joined today by Jenny Lewison who is the other half of the Benedetti sessions team Viola um, and I'm also delighted today to be joined by cellist David Munn and double bassist Alice Kent and they are here to answer the, some of the amazing questions that you have sent in to us. So, Maybe I will start with you, David, and I will start with the first question that we're going to look at today, which is what, in your opinion, are the pros and cons of great music exams? Mm. There are many cons and not many pros. No, that's <laughs> not fair. Um, I, so pros, pros first of all, uh, particularly some of the syllabuses, syllabi. syllabi? <laughs> Yeah, syllabi. Oh, the syllabi are a bit more um, inclusive than others. Uh, sometimes I find I get a little bit frustrated that you know you get the new syllabus out and then it's actually just the same old pieces again. Um, mm. So yeah, some of them have a real range of pieces, um, which is great things. And um, I think the main positive for me is giving uh, yourself or your students something to aim towards, and just having a kind of focal point for their learning. Um, that was kind of the thing that I used to aim towards anyway when I was a youngster. <laughs> was like, I've got my next exam around the corner, so I'll crap a better practice, sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, can you say that? Yeah, yeah, you could say that. That's okay. okay. We're I think you that. did, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean crap. I mean, can you say that I don't practice? <laughs> uh, no, that you can't say. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and Alice, what, what are your feelings on the pros and cons of grading music exams? Well, um, I'd agree there are quite a lot of cons actually but I like the idea that they do they're an easy goal for many people mm. especially if you're quite a young learner you just all oh, right I'm work, working towards this and you've got a focus yeah I like the uh, fact that a lot of the British um, grades six seven and eight count as UCAS points if you get good marks and stuff I think that's a really nice thing yeah um, but um, it does worry me that sometimes you might get bogged down. I, I've heard of young students doing like their grade one. Uh, oh no, it wouldn't be grade one because I think you can't fail that. But it, you know, the early grades failing mm. and then demanding a retry, which is a really, I think a bit of a strange thing. And people should really think about that because what is the aim of that for a small child? Surely they just, Mm. keep going try new pieces and move on rather than redo an exam which is very open to interpretation um, yeah i mean i i know exactly what you mean and I've, I've sometimes found with students that um it's for some students it's incredibly motivating and some students really take to that system and they go through it absolutely brilliantly and it adds a real structure to their progress and it really gives them milestones and really helps Occasionally, especially in the early stages, I don't know if this is something you find, David, or an analyst as well, actually, but um, that it can occasionally even slow a child down at the beginning if oh, they yes. are focusing majorly on three particular pieces towards one day, which may be quite far in the future, when they could actually potentially be moving through. Moving on. Or, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you have, Alice, do you, do you have any, anything to so add? So often there? people are waiting to take their exam and they're spending ages and ages on something. And then, I don't know, you might not put them in for that term exam because most, you know, they've got one piece which is great, but the rest isn't ready. So then they're carrying on and, you know, then you've got that, do we swap out the piece that's actually now getting a bit stale? Mm. Um, and actually just missing the point of music making, of just playing, enjoying it, learning more repertoire, moving on, you know, getting a bit stagnant in it. Um, mm. Yeah, it's quite some some of the syllabi are really useful from a bass player point of view because um, they're quite useful to just flip through and see what our repertoire is. There isn't a lot and it's all there in a big list, you know, so that's mm. quite that's a pro. There's a pro there for you. That's yeah. yeah, David, have you got any thoughts there? I think one of the frustrations for me is um, 
don't mishear me because I don't I don't mean this in a mean way, but I think sometimes it's a little bit lazy to go to the syllabus and just like choose what's next on the list. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, I like to think in terms of my teaching that I'm I'm thinking of the skill. Like I'm thinking, what does the child need to learn next? Mm. And it's not necessarily that piece. It's maybe a skill that's contained within that piece. But like if we just if we flip it on its head and like if we wrote out a list of skills in the order they should learn them in and then try to find pieces that that fit those things i think that would be a much better way around mm, yeah. i think um, yeah so yeah i remember i think it was a bass player actually um a bass teacher kathy elliott she's um, a very good who, bass teacher yeah, yeah nice lady who was, who was saying to to us as a group of staff uh, she was saying you know when particularly at a young stage at a beginner stage you should really only have one new thing in every piece you know, mm. you shouldn't be asking your kids to learn two or three new techniques. Overload new them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I tried to basically use the syllabuses, syllabi. <laughs> is that not a pudding? <laughs> Syllabub. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Syllabub. Mm. Yeah, I always get confused between my puddings and my confused. <laughs> anyway, so I use them, but I don't, yeah, I, I, I try to think of the skills more. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's so true that you don't necessarily want to be introducing their position and a flat major, for example. So it's 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 finding the things that work for you in terms of your own the sort of scheme of work that you have in mind for your students, and then hoping that you're able to feed in in that way with the system. Jenny, do you have anything there that you'd like to? I mean, everything has been said. I would say I, just that um, as a teacher, you want to have do you want to be able to give that bespoke service, right? So I think um, it's also possible to get the best, like all those cons of graded exams. You could also kind of um, metabolize into your own bespoke teaching, and it, hopefully you could just do it all in one, and everyone's happy yeah. without that kind of uh, competition and that nasty feeling that kids sometimes get, like uh, you're on grade three, I'm on grade four. Yeah, exactly. We don't like that. Um, I see. I see these things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's um, all to say. <laughs> yeah, and then just finally on this point about exams, um, uh, maybe I'll start with you this time, David. Have you found that um, the results sometimes have been discouraging for children or even for you as a teacher? And then on what kind of ways have you found that can help with dealing with that kind of thing? So it maybe doesn't come as too much of a surprise to say that I don't really use them that much <laughs> from what I've already said. Yeah, so I, I tend yeah. not to put them in. I would use the pieces, but I don't necessarily go through the process with my kids. So I, I don't think I've really had that occasion. You know, all the kids mm. I've put in have just been amazing, really. I just I don't really know what to say. <laughs> I think it must be the teacher. I mean, that's got to be, hasn't it? Um, what about Alice? Officer? Alice, have you, have you had anything, uh, those kind of experiences that you can share some wisdom? Um, generally speaking, if I put someone in for an exam, and they're they're going to fail which hardly ever happens but it, if that's the case i pull them out and i don't put them through it mm -hmm. i just say it doesn't matter whatever but um i have had someone who wanted some sort of goal and it seemed like a really structured thing for them they did their exam they were kind of caught off guard on the day i think someone was being trained up to be an examiner. So he was kind of caught off guard. There were more people in the room than he expected. He didn't know who to play to. It was all suddenly a bit, I mean, he was fairly young and it was all a bit, uh, put, yeah, put him off. So he didn't do great. Well, in fact, he did, he almost passed, which was almost the worst thing about it. You know, when you get your mark mm. and you're like, gosh, you were one mark off, which that's pretty brutal. But, um, they were tempted to redo the whole process, which I think is absolute madness. There's absolutely no point um, whatsoever, I don't think, you know, maybe get your money back, but go through it again. I just wouldn't put anyone through that. But so we actually just completely threw the rule book out and we're just doing mainly transcriptions of rock and pop tunes that whatever they want to play. And we mm. do that. And as a result, we, and we tend to stick to, uh, certain keys and stuff and um, work through it that way and you know graded exams are forgotten history sort of thing now. So, but... so you kind of um, widened the scope of the, of the genres and everything that he, that he was looking at and just got a yeah. bit outside of the box. Yeah, yeah I, totally. I, I removed it. Completely different, you know. Yeah, I mean I think it can be helpful if, if um, children can 
have try to have the mindset that each exam is not the end point of their learning and their yeah, it's, it's not is one, it no it's just one kind of step in the process and, and getting a not great mark in your grade three doesn't mean that you're not still making fantastic progress and progressing and it all depends when it comes and what happens on the day and all of those things and I tend to try if I'm doing exams with my students I try best I can that they will have that mindset that it's not the end of everything and when that exam happens it's not that's just the beginning of the next chapter of their learning so I think sometimes that can help and mm. um, Jenny do you Oh, sorry, oh, sorry David. Say, when I when I did my grade eight, when I when I when I passed my grade eight, I had no idea there was all this other music out there. Yeah, yeah it's same. Like, I thought I'd reached the end. I yeah. So shocked. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't I even remember what I got for my for any of my grades actually, and I think I skipped most of them. I skipped straight to grade nine, and I can't remember <laughs> my mark. <laughs> Oh, great. Um, right. So the next question um, that we had is, was what strategies would you use to encourage teenagers to practice, especially when they're so overloaded with homework and other ensembles, i.e. orchestra inside and outside of school, their own personal practice, chamber music projects, just someone with a full schedule. Um, Alice, do you have uh, some wisdom there? Well, I, I get like a broomstick and I get a piece of string and off the end of it, I put some chocolate and I sort of don't, no, I don't do any of that. Um, well, I think from a bass player point of view, a lot of um, enjoyment comes from playing in ensembles, actually. And mm. teenagers, especially if they're in an ensemble on an orchestra and often going on a tour, it's like the best time ever. And so I actually would just link it in with that and learning the parts so they can also play it really well. Mm. Uh, short little things. And again, a bass player thing is I often say, just leave your bass out. And if you walk past it and fancy playing some stuff or grooving along to whatever tune you like, just do that and then put it down, no pressure. And then that way it's more of a light relief from the seriously heavy workloads and stuff. And then you also, you know, looking forward to orchestra, seeing your mates, and also knowing how to play the music and linking that, that bit in. That's yeah. kind of, you know, yeah. So you kind of, you sort of work it to your advantage and you, and, you, and you basically embrace all of that kind of ensemble playing as much as you can, bring it all in and, and use it in your own teaching. Yeah. Um, David, what, what, what kind of strategies do you use with teenagers um, from practice and... I mean, I like to encourage them to try and do it first thing, which yeah. I know for, for teenagers is like probably the worst time of the day, but like psychologically, it's it's the best for your ears, right? But it's also the best just so that you don't have it looming over you for the rest of the day, particularly if you've got loads of other stuff after school. Most clubs are after school. So um, yeah, if they can do just even a bit in the morning to just, as we say in Scotland, take the edge off it, <laughs> then it's going to be a good thing. Mm. Um, I also, I think I mentioned this in one of the other Ask Our Tutor, Super Tutor, Asky Tutor thing. <laughs> and um, it was about accountability. And like, I would and try and encourage teenagers to like ask a pal if they can buddy up and they mm. can just hold each other accountable in their practice. So like, what are you going to do tomorrow? 20 minutes. Okay, right, I'll do the same. Yeah. And I'll text you at this time and check to see if you've done it sort of thing. It mm. obviously needs to be somebody that they trust. Um, but yeah, that's something I've used before. Yeah. Another thing I was gonna I was gonna chuck into the mix was just trying to like keep them inspired. What we really want is not them to to want to learn the piece of music that you've given them, but we want them to learn for the sake of learning and staying curious about learning. So anything that we can do to help them become curious in their minds, whether that's talking about books or talking about art or talking about live things they've been to see, anything like that is just gonna give them that extra little, oh I'm gonna go and explore that or I wonder how they did that on their cello. I'm going to go and try that out. Yeah, totally. I think I definitely think uh, the inspiration factor of, of seeing other people play their instrument as well, something that is so easy to forget as a teacher when you're sort of wondering, why is this person not really practicing and why are they not maybe feeling like the inspiration that I'm feeling about the instrument? And I think sometimes it's easy to forget that they have, maybe they haven't even experienced a live concert or you know they or if they don't have access to that maybe bringing that in some way into the lesson to try and kind of 
show them the possibilities for what their instrument can do. I think that can really help. Um, Jenny, do you have any kind of teenager ideas? I would say with teenagers, it's probably all about finding out what their driving force is that really excites them. So whether, as Alice said, if it's social, um, getting out there, putting on like a sight reading party or something at the house instead of a like a hanging out party, or if they love video games to like work out, can you play that video game music on your instrument? Like, can you yeah. repose it or something? Or just if you love podcasts or, or a Netflix show, you could just practice your shifts while you watch something on Netflix. Like pretty much what Alice was saying as well, just do anything you possibly can at the same time, just to integrate in as many different ways without it being a massive faff. Um, just get being on the instrument, that's all you need hmm. yeah and rewards as well huh? any, any rewards that they can yes and with. rewards yeah sure you know i'm not like talking about like, chucking them a little cookie but I'm not, <laughs> you know if there is something that they want to do that's social that's that's fun then set, set themselves that as a goal and then they have to earn it yeah yeah another one other thing i find sometimes is if you are introducing some kind of new major technical point if possible, introducing it in a shorter piece can sometimes help. So the piece where they're learning this complicated new technique, if it's mm. kind of short and self-contained, but the other piece that they're playing that's longer is, is maybe like t more technically easy, keeps the bow on the string for a longer period of time, but isn't a struggle. Sometimes that can help if they're starting to feel like, oh, this is all a bit overwhelming. Mm -hmm. That can sometimes contribute to a bit more bow on string time. Um, right, let's go on to our third and final question then. Um, and I will, who did I start with before? Did I start with Alice? I, I started with David, so I'll start with Alice. Um, okay, so Alice, um, would you think that being from another country can decrease the chance of having the same opportunities as locals to get certain positions within the profession? Uh, I, I'd really say not, not in the profession, not anymore. There's, um, no. <laughs> No. Uh, and more and more often now um, with auditions for the profession they're becoming screened there's just there's no real room for it and uh, I, no really As, and even now you can even send in or, uh, recorded auditions can't you so um, mm. it really does go on the playing I think um, so yes great yeah. thank you and David would you what would you think on that point I completely disagree. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's kind of similar. Uh, I was I was going to sort of like chuck in a bit of a bonus question here because I, I I don't think that um, and it certainly shouldn't be the case that that happens. Uh, and like orchestras have policies that make sure it doesn't happen. Um, but what I do think still happens, and maybe you would disagree with this, but the sort of it's who you know type mm -hmm. of mentality, I think is still a thing. You know, you can sometimes mm -hmm. pick up work because of the people that you've met as you've been networking and you get gigs through people that are your pals. And so bonus question, whoa, Ooh. how do you, how do you do networking in a way that's not cringeworthy and desperately just looking for work? You be yourself. Ooh, drop the mic. <laughs> I love the bonus question. That's <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. Jenny, maybe, would you, do you want to tackle that one, Jenny? Oh, wow. I think it just has to, as, as much as possible, you have to ask yourself, well, why am I wanting to be a musician? What are my crucial things that I don't want to compromise on? Um, integrity, hopefully, is number one. And so by being integritous with the friends that you make, the reasons that you make friends with them, I mean, hopefully that would just naturally, hopefully lead to um, a real friendship and, and, and people won't ask you if they sense any funny business like that, right? I mean, it has to be based on, yeah. on merit and your playing and how genuine you are. Um, hopefully, I mean, I don't really know what else to sort of suggest really. How about you guys? Yeah, I think, I definitely think, I think um, being positive and nice to be around in work is really important. So when you go somewhere and you are meeting, some, you know, make sure that you, you do, um, you know, sort of, be as friendly as possible and enjoy the work that you're doing and kind of give off a positive energy that really helps and then also remember that every time that you get your instrument out you need to be playing to the best of your possible ability and I know that that sounds really obvious but remembering that every time your bow is on the string it's important that it's the best that you can give so just bringing all of that to every time you work and hopefully that will kind of yeah. rub off on the people around you and they'll remember that 
positivity that you, that you brought. Yeah. David, did yeah. you have anything to ask your own question? No, it's just something I've always kind of like, I've never really felt comfortable because I'm not the guy who goes out after the concert and like goes and tries to chat to the right person. I just, mm -hmm. I, I just, it just. But I don't think, yeah, you, you, people see through it. If you don't, if you don't want to go out for a pint after a concert and a lot of people don't, they go home. You know, if you don't want to go out for a pint, but you force yourself, then you're miserable to be around. You know, you just have to do what you would do and yeah. just be yourself. People see through stuff yeah. so often mm. you just got to be yourself the whole time yeah and i think also take opportunities when they come up so even if you think oh i'm not totally sure if i'm ready to do that concert or that whatever mm. to just go for it and, and do the best that you can and don't feel that you're not ready just jump in there and get involved um you know things will come and here we are <laughs> and here we are exactly like with uh, online teaching we've had to barely jump into that i think the past few weeks um well Guys, it's been absolutely amazing to chat to you and thank you so much for your wisdom and your insight into all of those questions that we were sent. And thank you so much to the ambassadors for the questions that they sent in. And we hope mm. that that has answered them for you. And this is the very end of Ask Our Tutors. So we will have to do a wave goodbye, I think. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Farewell. Bye. <laughs>